Assalamu alaikum, how are you running? Assalamu alaikum, Kenza, ABL, Sister Benta. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Ala, Eric. Hope all is well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamda lillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nasta'ahdih. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم ما بعده السلام عليكم How is everybody? How's everybody adjusting to the time change? Alhamdulillah No, it's like that, that time between Uhur and Asr is so short now. You know what I'm saying? But I do appreciate that we can we can have the class now without any any uh, break. Assalamu alaikum, Amir. Careful, Amor, Khuya. Alhamdulillah. So we're still reading in the Shema'il, right? Uh, a book all about the description, the life, the character, um, the personal affects of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, and of course we chose this book because it is quite a celebrated book um, and I think in this time especially when there's much talk about human rights and much talk about how we relate to each other as people I think it's wise to invest uh, some time in learning about that critical and important second half of the shahada, Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, you know, la ilaha illallah is always important, right? But Muhammad Rasulullah is essentially what makes a Muslim a Muslim, right? We are not the only people who believe in divine unity. We're not the only people that believe in the oneness of God. But we are the only people who believe that Muhammad Wasallam is the last and final messenger of Allah. So we were, a long time no see. Salam alaikum. We love to have you back in the space, man. Alhamdulillah. Um, uh, this chapter, it, it's really interesting because um, even though the chapter is entitled Babu Ma Ja'afi Sifati Khubzi Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what has been narrated concerning the bread of the Prophet we only get one description of the bread of the Prophet All of the other hadith are about the simplicity or the frugality with which he lived. So it's, it's interesting just to think about the chapter heading and to think about how uh, Imam At-Tirmidhi who compiled this book, how he understood that chapter heading that for him to talk about the food of the prophet, peace be upon him, was to talk about the frugality, to talk about the austerity is the perhaps correct word, how, how little the prophet and his family would subsist on. So he begins, عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أنها قالت ما شبع آل محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم من خبز الشعير يومين متتابعين حتى قبض رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. On the authority of Aisha, who reported the family of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم never ate their fill of barley bread two days in a row up until the soul of the messenger of Allah was taken. So at no point did um, Islam ever become a source of wealth for the family of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, and these are things that I think are very hard for us to swallow, and, 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 and rightfully so. Um, the Prophet would pray, Allahumma ja'al kuta ali Muhammad, maj'al rizqa ali Muhammad in kuta. He would pray, oh Allah, make the provision of the family of Muhammad enough to fulfill their daily needs. That's what the Prophet would not pray that his family became wealthy and powerful and affluent and that they lived in luxury and opulence. 
You Allahumma ja'al rizqa ali Muhammadin quta. Allah just give my family enough to subsist. And it's, it's interesting that wealth is a test and poverty is a test, right? Um, those of us in possession of what is almost hysterically referred to as disposable income, <laughs> disposable, mashallah, what a term, right? Disposable income should know that the fact that we have um, this, kind of, this kind of provision is not a sign that we're better than anyone else, nor is it a sign that we have better work ethic or that we are more industrious. In fact, some of the hardest working, our Imam Dawood Wali said this this weekend, some of the hardest working people we know are not the most affluent people we know, right? Some of the most diligent people we know are not the richest people that we know. Once you, once you, you realize that, that there, there is no um, cause effect relationship. Now I'm not saying one does not have cause to work hard, but if you have been given wealth, understand that this is your test. This is what God has tested you with. And he hasn't tested many others with it. You know, um, I don't know what the statistics are now post COVID, but I remember being startled the first time I heard the amount of people that live on less than $2 a day, right? In the world, I'm saying globally. So when you talk about the 1%, we have to understand that globally, most of us represent the 1%. You know, people that God has given abundantly and we have to recognize that as a test. And we hope that we acquit ourselves uh, accordingly, right? So when you hear that the family of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, didn't even have baked leavened bread two days in a row, this is the simplicity with which they lived. And this is the family of the Prophet والسلام, It completely undermines any notion of God-fearingness or being loved by God, being definitely connected to wealth. Like when people talk about like the prosperity gospel, it's not true. Doesn't mean, now they say, dunya fa inna Allah yu'atihi ila man yuhib wa ila man la yuhib. Allah gives the stuff of this world to people he loves and people he does not love. So it is not a definitive sign one way or another. If someone is in possession of wealth, this does not mean that they're despised by God. It does not mean that God has cursed them. No, no. But it does not mean that they are chosen. They are the elect of God because they have wealth. You know, I heard the Drink Champs interview with Kanye. Kanye told him, I'm the leader. Why? Because you got nine billion? What is this? I'm the leader. God made me the leader. Why? Because you have money? No, it's character that makes someone elect. I'm the leader. Why, because you got nine billion? This is monopoly money. They're just giving this stuff away to everybody, right? So it's not a sign that you've been chosen by God just because you have money, right? The Prophet alayhi wasalam, we know was the Habib of Allah. We know he was beloved to Allah. And Aisha radiallahu anha is saying that in the home of the Prophet alayhi wasalam, we didn't even get baked leavened bread two days in a row. We live with hardship. And we knew, and we know that the Prophet ﷺ was the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next hadith we have. Haddatana Hariz ibn Uthman an Sulaym ibn Amir qala sami'atu aba umama yaqulu ma kana yafdudu an ahli bayti rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khubzu al-sha'ir. I heard on the authority of Hadiz ibn Uthman, who reported, who narrated to us on the authority of Sulaim ibn Amir, who reported, I heard Abu Umama say, there was never any extra barley bread left in the house of the Prophet <clears throat> there's, a, there's a subtlety in this hadith that um, There was never any barley bread left 
meaning the Prophet ﷺ would feed his family and then what was left over, he would give away, right? He wasn't, you know, in fact, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would give everything of his surplus, he would give it away in charity every day. Every day, everything he had above what was a necessity, above what was necessary, he would give uh, every day. So here, Abu Umama is saying, the Prophet ﷺ did not have like food stored up in his house. Right? He would take care of his family, and then what was left, he would seek someone hungry that he could give it to. Right? And we have to, you know, the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina to Munawwara, and of course, people were singing. Oh, one second. It's my mother. I gotta answer this. This is the one you gotta take, you know what I'm saying? Um, so um, the Prophet والسلام, he said when he came into Medina someone came to him and they said Awsina, ya Rasulullah. give us some advice ya Rasulullah. give us a wasiya and he said salam, spread peace be people of peace this is the first advice the Prophet والسلام, gave to people living in community salam. Be someone who wants to spread and proliferate peace. That we want to live in peace and we want those among us to live in peace. And um, very interesting li linguistic piece right here. Um, in order to be at peace with others, you have to be at war with yourself. Meaning your, 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 your undisciplined passion your desires, right? You have to, be, you know, they say when everyone is at peace with themselves, they're at war with everybody else, right? When you're, when you're at war with your, and I don't mean at war as in a state of uh, perturbation, at war as in <clears throat> I am actively trying to discipline my tongue. I am actively trying to um, reduce how much I take and extend how much I give. People like that, are, we can live with each other. We can live with, with each other. You know, in the Sufi tradition, they say that you can have 20 saliks, 20 spiritual aspirants that can live together in one home, sharing things. And, but for, the, for two tyrants, the world is not enough for them. Think about that. You have two tyrants that cannot share the world. The world is not big enough for me and you. If you're here, I can't really fulfill my destiny. We're talking about Ardullahi Wazia, the whole dunya. Think about that. This, you know, you think, I mean, when I, when I would think about, you know, people that were working on trying to require less, they can live together. It's easy. Then the second thing the Prophet Alaihissalam said, Feed people. Man, there is, you know, it's amazing how, you know, I'm, I don't cook much. My, my repertoire is uh, admittedly quite limited. Cereal, grilled cheese, eggs, all manner of sandwiches. <laughs> I'm very good at making sandwiches for my children, you know, right? But when I do cook, and my wife, mashallah, my wife, she has always cooked well, but now she really cooks well, mashallah, right? But what I notice is that I, I you know, this is, and this is just anecdotal. This might not apply to anyone but me. When I'm cooking, I find that I need to eat less. Like there's a certain satisfaction I get out of realizing that people are enjoying the food that I cooked. Like I get a satisfaction out of it almost like a, a certain kind of satiety out of it. Like I'm, I feel good to know that you've eaten, right? And that you've enjoyed the food, right? Um, also 
sharing your food is a way of ensuring that your food is blessed. The Prophet ﷺ said, the food that's enough to you know, uh, satisfy one is enough to satisfy two. Right? Now he wasn't, now of course, if we're just looking at this from a material perspective, well, that's half the dish, right? If, I, if I'm, this is one dish and I'm gonna share it with Amir, I'm only going to get half of it. But the baraka, right? The Arabs, they say, al kathra min al baraka, wa laysat al baraka min al kathra. That abundance is from blessing, but blessing is not from abundance, right? So the feeling that what you have is plentiful comes from what you have being blessed. But the feeling that what you have is blessed will not come from what you have being plentiful. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you share what you have, it acquires blessing, right? So even though, I mean, you'll find that that's your Isha, subhanAllah. But you'll find that people who are always sharing what they have, I'm telling this is something I've seen, they have the least concern about money because they're sharing. And sometimes I think of that in very practical terms, that in as much as your being in possession of this critical thing is good for so many people, God continues to give you because you are a conduit to that wealth, those resources, reaching other people. That's a, that's a source of blessing. That's a source of blessing. The wealthiest people that I've ever been able you know, to, to, to you know, uh, have a private audience with, without exception, Muslims, when I ask them, what's the secret, man, to the money? What's the secret to the money? All of them tell me, sadaq, giving. Giving. And what's the secret to the money? Giving. But do you believe that? So you have to, you actually have to, to give in a way that suggests, I really believe this. Right? I really believe this. Right? So this hadith has a subtlety, mashallah. The next hadith we have is An Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. المتتابعه طاويا وهو واهله لا يجدون عشاء وكان اكثر خبزهم خبز الشعير on the authority of ibn abbas who reported the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his family would spend consecutive nights extremely hungry and would not find anything to eat for dinner the most common form of bread they would eat was barley bread now, this hadith also contains a subtlety. This is the Messenger of Allah, And Ibn Abbas, who was a cousin of the Prophet, is explaining that sometimes the Prophet used to go to bed hungry. Now, if he wanted to, and this is mentioned by many commentators, if he would have made his need known to the community, people would have rushed to give him their very last. If the Prophet والسلام, so much as said, hmm, my stomach grumbled slightly. Everybody would have, no, Ya Rasulullah, let me give you, let me give you. But the fact of the matter is that he did not do that. And there's some dignity in that, right? The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of ta'afuf. That there's a kind of person that if you did not know, this is in the Quran, just because of how she carries herself, how he carries himself, you would think that they did not need anything. You just couldn't tell. Right? There's a kind of person that Unless you really investigate it, you would never conclude they're in need of any help. That maybe they could use, you know, I guess in the word of 2021 is stimulus. <laughs> they're in need of some kind of uh, stimulus, some kind of financial help, or some kind of other help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
If you make your charity, if your attention um, is turned to people like that, your charity is even more blessed because it's more work to find them. They don't ask like every like other people ask. Some people, you know, the saying in the, uh, the African-American tradition, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You see, you know what that means? The squeaky wheel gets the grease? What do you think it means? Right, so, you know, you have like a cart and, you know, one of the wheels, like, that's the one you put the, the grease on. The person that's asking the loudest is the person that everybody gives. Right? Some people say a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So some people are very open about what they need. I need help. I need help. Somebody, you got anything? Kenzie, you got, Emil, you got something? Benton, you got... Other people, there's a, there's a kind of modesty or a better word is bashfulness. They're just not going to do that. Right? I remember being in Yemen um, and there was a uh, a gentleman who, for all intents and purposes, you would never conclude needed any financial help. In fact, I would have sworn that he always had money folded up in his breast pocket, you know, of his, of his shirt. And when I started to inquire about people I could give my riyals to before I travel, right, because I wasn't going to convert them from dollars to riyals back to dollars. To me, that just seems petty. <laughs> it's like they're already rehabs. Just give them away before you go. Um, and so when somebody brought his name up, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I was actually intending to give to someone poor. Right? I was, I was said, you know, in Arabic, like I was intending to give to someone that's a scheme, not him. He's, you know, he seems like he's doing pretty well. And somebody then cited the ayah for me. Ya sabu a person who's ignorant would think that these people are self-sufficient because of their ta'afuf, their, their, their dignity or their bashfulness. He's actually in need of help. And I said, subhanAllah, I would have never guessed. And I went and I gave it to him. So I've seen people like that. They go out of their way to pretend as though, I don't need money. No, I don't need anybody's money. And you have to find a way to give it to them. Find a way to, you know, maybe through some kind of work or, but, right? But the Prophet ﷺ was in this hadith demonstrating that sunnah of not asking openly, right? And then the last part of this hadith, that he ate the food of the people, that most of the time the bread he ate was not muraqqaq. The, like fine bread was called murakkak, like bread of fine flour. The prophet ate rough, you know, rough unleavened bread, right? Barley bread, the bread that the common people ate, right? MashaAllah. The next hadith we have, عَنْ سَحْلِ بْنِ سَعَدٍ أَنَّهُ قِيلَ لَهُ أَكَلَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنَّ قِيَ يَعْنِ الْحَوَارَ فَقَالَ سَهْلٌ ما رأى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم النقية حتى لقي الله عز وجل فقيل له هل كانت لكم مناخل على أهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ما كانت لنا مناخل قيل كيف كنتم تصنعون بالشعير قال كنا ننفخه فيطير منه ما طار ثم نعجن on the authority of Abdul Rahman, he is the son of Abdullah ibn Dinar, mashallah. Narrated to us, Abu Hazm narrated to us. Sahil ibn Sa'ad was asked, did the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, ever eat bread made from fine flour? Sahil replied, the messenger of Allah never saw fine flour. Like that wasn't even something he ever saw before. It was like, it's like asking, did he ever eat bread made of fine flour? He never saw fine flour. Which is kind of like a, um, it's like a, it's like a realization of how far we've come from that time. And this was very early in the, the, the history of Islam. Like, did he ever eat bread from fine flour? How about this? He never saw fine flour. Right. 
and he said, then he was asked, did you all have seeds like to sift the flour to, you know, right? He said, during the time of the messenger of Allah, so I said, he replied, we did not have seeds. Meaning we didn't have, like you couldn't, you couldn't make fine flour. He said, so how did you make bread with barley? He said, we would blow onto the barley and whatever large particles were in it would fly out. Then we would knead the rest of it into the dough. That's what made it the rough barley bread. Right? They couldn't make like fine bread that, that you could use a sieve and you could get all of the larger particles. And you know, a friend of mine spent like three years living in Mauritania, studying Islam. And I asked him, I said, what did you eat there? He said, life there was very hard. <laughs> he said, he was in the Waqshu. He said, life there was very hard. He said, life there was very hard. And he said, you know, we would often, you know, eat dinner, you know, um, after Muslim. And he said, you know, there was no electricity and you really couldn't see what you were eating. And you really didn't want to see what you were eating. <laughs> you, really, you really didn't want to see what you were eating. He said, because like in the grain and in the rice, a lot of it was dirt. He said, a lot of it was mixed with dirt. I was saying, subhanAllah. He said, so, you know, uh, you might not want to ask me too much about that if you want to encourage somebody to go study there. <laughs> you, know what I'm saying? you might not want to ask too much about that. You know, it was, a, it was a hard life. So he would say, look, we didn't even have seeds. It wasn't, life was hard. Man, when we read things like this, whether they come from Islamic sources or not, just when we read historical reports about the great hardship with which people used to live, hopefully it increases our gratitude. You know, it's almost like, you know, I, I travel often for work and I'll find myself getting upset with Delta because the, the plane is behind schedule. And I'm, I'm sitting in the terminal, stamping my feet, in chairs, displaying this uh, nasty attitude with the, the, the ticket agent. I have somewhere to go, I have somewhere to be. And I'm thinking, I'm literally taking in one hour and 30 minutes a trip that would take people 300 years ago a week. And I'm, and I'm just, just like that. And I'm still complaining. It's almost like, subhanAllah, um, you know, I mean, we are um, literally drowning in amenity. We are drowning in luxury. I mean, when I look at just the ease of accessing information, I can just get on my telephone and just, what do you want to know? You know, and we scarcely even say thank you to Allah. SubhanAllah. We do things that many generations ago people would have considered miraculous. Like, I mean, even like you think about like the main miracles of Islam, like the Isra. The Prophet والسلام, traveled to from Mecca to Al Quds, right? to Jerusalem in the span of one night and came back. And that was amazing. You know how many flights you can get from Mecca to Jerusalem in a single night now? Five, six. <laughs> you know, and it, this was something that people thought was miraculous. And we do it every day and we don't even, we, we think nothing of it. You know, it's like the Arabs, they say, إِذَا ظَهَرَ sabab ذهب الْعَجَبِ if the, if the way something happens is clear, there's no amazement after that. Oh, it's, it's no big deal, right? But if you stop, you reflect, you gain some perspective, you'll realize that, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not riding a, you know, a winged creature, but I am riding a, some, you know, a contraption flying 35,000 feet in the sky. Subhanallah, subhanaladhi, sakharalana, hadha. Praise be to God that has made these means of transport 
easy for us. Right, subhanAllah. Then he said, we would blow on it and whatever large particles were in it would fly out and then we would lead the rest of it into the dough. Next hadith we have, عن أنس ابن مالك قال ما أكل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على خوان ولا في سكرجة سكرجة ولا خبز له مرقق قال فقلت من قتادة فعلى ما كانوا يأكلون قال على هذه السفر قال محمد بن بشار يونس هذا الذي روى عن كتادة هو يونس الإسكاف On the authority of Anas ibn Malik who reported the Prophet of Allah وسلم, never ate upon a khiwan which is a small table right he never ate the Prophet وسلم, never ate food upon a table and so um uh, 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 um, uh, Yunus al Iskaf, he asked, he said, and, or oh, and the next part is, and thin baked bread was never made for him. He said, So I asked Katada, so what did they eat on? Like, the standard of living had changed so much in that first 200 years that he couldn't, okay, it's like me telling you, you know, uh, we didn't eat on tables. Okay, so what did you eat on? Duh, the floor. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you think we ate on? But he couldn't like, so what, what did he eat on, right? Um, and he said he never had uh, finely uh, uh, baked bread. And he said, he ate qala ala hadhi sufr, that the Prophet والسلام, would eat upon small leather mats or small reed mats, the sufar, right? So those are like, um, like chargers. You guys know chargers? So you know you have like a, a, a table charger, but some of them might be like uh, wicker, some would be glass. The Prophet ﷺ would eat like, the dish would be placed on like a small charger, like a small charger, right? SubhanAllah. MashaAllah. We have another hadith عن الشعب عن مسروق قال دخلت على عائشة فدعت لي بطعام وقالت ما أشبع من طعام فأشاء أن أبكي إلا بكيت قال قلت لما قالت أذكر الحال التي فارق عليها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الدنيا والله ما شبع من خبز so, on the authority of Sha'bi, on the authority of Masruq, who reported, one day I went to visit Aisha. And this is very important. Aisha was a sheikh among the Sahaba. People would come to her seeking legal opinion. People would come to her to study with her. People would come to her asking questions about the Prophet ﷺ. And so I think it's important to recognize that in a society that was uh, without question a male dominated society, the prophet's mission was 23 years. And after that 23 years, these men that would have formerly never been able to imagine a woman as an authority figure, saw Aisha as someone from whom they would come, learn from, sit with. Um, she really was, she could tell them anything all the way up until the battle of the camel, she's leading an army into battle, right? And we have to, I mean, you know, it's very painful to think about those, those early intramural wars among the companions. Um, and a lot of Muslim presenters, teachers, scholars don't like talking about that time much. But I'm always curious as to what transformation occurred in the thinking of women that Aisha felt like, no, I'll lead a battalion into battle. And that's, com and, and I feel completely valid. I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely um, assured in that, that I could do this. 
Like, what did she learn from the Prophet <laughs> that she felt confident leading men into battle, right? So Masruq um, said that he went to visit Aisha and she called for someone to bring him some food, right? Then she said, I do not ever eat my fill of food and then wish to cry except that I end up crying, which is, I don't like that translation. What she says is that whenever I'm about to get, whenever enough food is served that I could eat it and get full, I always find that I'm, I'm moved to tears. And then I actually do start crying. And so Masrook said, why? Like someone serves you food and you start crying. She replied, I remember the condition in which the messenger of Allah والسلام, left this world. I swear to God, he never ate his fill of bread and meat twice in the same day. Like that never happened to him. So she is in a sense um, dealing with some survivor's guilt, kind of like, look at how I live. And look at how the messenger of Allah left this world. He never got to, he never, he never experienced this. And even though this was his wife, and even though she had been taught by him, this is just the dunya, that's a natural feeling. Many of us have, you know, those of us that have been the um, products or even the drivers of upward mobility uh, in our own lives or in the lives of our children, We've, we've experienced some of that uh, realization or tension where it's like, man, look at how comfortably I live. My grandmother never got to experience this, even though she was much better than me, much more deserving than I, much more worthy than I. Right? This, is a, this is a feeling of a person of um, deep self-realization that, you know, when I think about like my ancestors, and I think about like the opportunities available to me, I really do feel that they would have done much more with those opportunities than I. They were much more industrious. They were much more faithful. They were much more community oriented than I. They were much more generous than I. And yet God has chosen to give this favor to me. SubhanAllah. You know, right? this, is, this is something that should sober you. When you think like, subhanAllah, especially like Muslim immigrants, we have relatives that have bombs exploding over their heads right now. We have relatives being interrogated at checkpoints right now. We have people that we are related to by blood that, you know, they have the idea of bursting into their homes right now. And here we are in Chicago eating dim dinner in comfort. And we're not worried about anything. We're not worried that somebody's gonna come through our door. We're not worried that we won't have food in the morning. We're not worried about being whisked off to prison in the night. Even though we know that in character, in piety, in generosity, in selflessness, those people are better than us. But yet we get this. Aisha said that she would feel that so deeply when she was given a, like a large meal that she would start crying. SubhanAllah, this is what I have. And the Prophet, he left this world impoverished. And this is what I have. SubhanAllah. Next hadith, Aisha call it. ما شبع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من خبز الشعير يومين متتابعين حتى قبض on the authority of Aisha who reported the messenger of Allah عليه وسلم never ate his fill of barley bread two days in a row up until he was taken in the last hadith مع أنس قال ما أكل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على خوان ولا أكل خبزا مرققا حتى مات on the authority of Anas who reported the messenger of Allah did not eat upon a small table or eat thin bread 
until he passed away. Like that never happened for him, right? The next chapter we have is Babu Idami What has been narrated concerning the condiment of the Prophet um, in the in the the Arab tradition, anything eaten with bread is con is considered idam, meaning anything you eat with bread. And a lot of what they would eat would be um, bread with different kinds of broth, bread with different kinds of soup, right? Um, soup, subhanAllah. Um, uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, add a cup of water to the soup and add some baraka to it. Of course, adding water to the soup would seemingly make it less flavorful. Uh, it would make it would dilute the soup a bit, but it stretches it so that you can give more, you know, you can give more away. So you'll find that soups and porridge, right? The term porridge is actually related to poverty. Porridge, like the 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 daily provision of the poor. That's actually why it's referred to as porridge, right? But now they sell it in stores. They call it multi meal. Right? Multi meal is porridge. Whenever you read like an old American novel and somebody references porridge, they're talking about uh, malta milk, right? That made, made with barley, right? That's porridge, right? So edam is all manner of porridge, soup. Um, um, uh, dates can also be mixed edam. Even meat could be considered a part of the term edam, anything you eat with bread. Um, one scholar, said, and this was a, this is an ancient child rearing manual that was written like in Morocco in like the 11th century. He said, if you want to raise grateful children, sometimes for dinner, no matter your state of wealth, just feed them bread with Edam to teach them how to be gratitude, to teach them how to be grateful, to teach them gratitude. This sometimes, and, and mashallah, Sometimes, at least maybe once a week, we eat a very simple meal in our home, rice with beans, right? Or bread with soup, right? So that our children know this is also, this can be a dinner. Some people, it's like, it's not dinner unless it's five courses. It's like, where's the dinner? Like, this is, this is the, no, that's not, that's not a dinner. Because dinner has to have a meat, it has to have a veggie, it has to have a bread, it has to have an appetizer. It has to have a dessert. If it doesn't have that, it's just a snack. It's like, no, no, sometimes, you know, learning to, and, and then he said, when you finish the very simple meal, still, praise be to God that has fed us and given us drink and has made us Muslims. Like say that and say it with sincerity so that your children know, mashallah, we've been fed. Alhamdulillah, these are the blessings of, of Allah that we will be asked about. You know, that hadith where the companions of the Prophet والسلام, first, uh, the Prophet comes out of his home because he's hungry. So he's like, he's pacing. Man, I'm really hungry. He's pacing. He runs into Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he asks and he asks him, Ya Abu Bakr, ma akhrajaka min baytik. Abu Bakr, what brought you out tonight? Right? Strange that I would encounter you. And Abu Bakr, given his, his nature, Abu Bakr just told a story. He's like, I came out in, in, in hopes that I would run into you. <laughs> I came out and hoped that maybe I would bump into you, you know, uh, fortuitously. And mashallah, it has come true. I bumped into you. And he said, shortly after that, they ran into Sayyidina Omar. And Sayyidina Omar, and we see the archetypical Abu Bakr Omar. Omar tells the truth. The Prophet asked him, Ma what brought you out from your house? Sayyidina Umar said, al hunger. <laughs> no niceties, no niceties, I'm hungry. And the Prophet ﷺ said, 
asabani ma asabak. The same thing that happened to you is what happened to me. I'm out here because I'm hungry. And so they say, uh, let's go to so-and-so's house. Maybe he might have something to eat. SubhanAllah, man, I, I mean, it reminds me of some of the ways that we grew up. Well, like you, like you had relatives that had food when you didn't have any food. Let's go to so-and-so's house. Maybe he has some food. And so they knock on the door and his wife answers the door. And they say, is, is so-and-so available? And she says, no, he went to a well to get us some, some cold water, but he should be back shortly. And so she let them come into the house and imagine this man who just left to provide his family with some water. He returns home and as guest, he has the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Omar all sitting in his house, waiting for him. It says that when he sees them, he almost like leaps for joy. Nobody in the world has better guests than me. And he tells his wife, prepare everything, like prepare everything. Prepare every, every, everything we got, we get, we're, we're putting the whole house on this dinner, right? But the Prophet والسلام, tells him, no, 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 no. Really, don't, don't slaughter a goat. Don't slaughter a sheep. Just something, something small will suffice. That the Prophet والسلام, does not want to be an overbearing guest. No, no, you have to do that. And so the man pretends to go along with this. Okay, okay, something small. Just, just, just something small, no problem. And so first he just gave them water and dates, right? And they're enjoying the water and the dates. And the Prophet ﷺ is shaking his head. And he looks at Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he looks at Sayyidina Umar and he says, these are the blessings of Allah that we will be asked about on the day of judgment. Now think about that, man. For most people, that scene would be a scene like, just be patient and things are going to get better soon, right? If, you, if I was so hungry that I had to go to Tariq's house and Amir was so hungry and Amy, L, we were so hungry, we had to go to Tariq's house and we're sitting there, we're eating some dates and drinking some water that Tariq gave us and I'm a leader. The last thing you would expect me to say is like reminding you about gratitude. You would probably expect me to remind you about patience. Like, you know, Amy, it's, just, Amy, uh, it's a little hard right now that, you know, the only reason we ate tonight was because Tardik Weaver gave us some dates and some, some water. But just be patient. The help of God is close. You know, the prophet tells them, mm, these are the blessings of Allah that we have to be thankful for. Friend of mine, scholar of Islam and a psychologist, he said that this is called a paradigm shift. Where a person is thinking, my situation is so difficult. And you intentionally, if you're in, if you're working kind of in a, a consultative capacity or a pastoral capacity, you shift their mind to gratitude. Right? As opposed to allowing them to dwell in hardship, you shift the perspective that mm, these are the blessings of Allah for which we have to be grateful. And of course, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Omar confirmed that, yes, these are the blessings of Allah. And soon after that, the man comes with the whole platter, you know, excuse me, lamb and rice and Right, the man comes with an entire platter. Right, popcorn, man. Never eat popcorn before a speech. You know, I, I I always fall for that uh, Chicago mix. You know, the cheese and but the stuff gets caught in your. You know what I'm saying? You and you could be like delivering a very serious address. You're like, and the last. 
most emphatic point made in this verse. And then a kernel of popcorn, like, oh, no, it, it kind of stole my thunder, right? Right? So the first hadith of this, of this section, عن عائشة أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال نعم الإدام الخل قال عبد الله في حديثه نعم الأدم أو الإدام الخل On the authority of Aisha, now this is going to shock you. When we're thinking about an edam or a condiment that you eat with. The Messenger of Allah said, what an excellent condiment is vinegar, al-khal. That was a meal to him, bread and vinegar. Mm. And he's praising this meal. What an excellent condiment is vinegar. Now, I might test one of my friends who regards himself as quite devout, quite adherent to the prophetic way. He comes to my house for dinner, I put a little small thing of vinegar, put a small, you know, saucer of bread. We're eating the meals of the sunnah tonight. <laughs> he would look at me like I was crazy. Man, what is this? This is bread and vinegar. The messenger of Allah This is such a good meal. Bread and vinegar, oh, such a good meal. SubhanAllah, right? MashaAllah. Um, the second hadith is عن سماك بن حرب قال سمعت إنه عمان بن بشير يقول ألستم في طعام وشراب ما شدتم لقد رأيت نبيكم صلى الله عليه وسلم وما يجد من الدقل ما يملأ بطناء on the authority of Simak ibn Harb, who reported, I heard Nu'aman ibn Bashir say, do you all not indulge in food and drink as much as you like? Like, you guys have as much food and drink as you like. I saw your prophet, alayhi wasalam, at times unable to find even the lowest quality dates with which to fill his stomach. Dakal. Dakal is the lowest quality dates. Right, and so he's again. This is kind of like look at you all, and look at the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Right, Mashallah. Hmm. عن جابر بن عبد الله قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم الإدام الخل. Same hadith on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah who reported the Messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة said, "What an excellent condiment vinegar is." And then we have عن زهدم الجرمي قال كنا عند أبي موسى الأشعري فأوتي بلحم دجاج فتنحى رجل من القوم فقال ما لك فقال إني رأيتها تأكل شيئا فحلفت أن لا أكلها قال أذن فإني رأيت رسول عيسى أذن فإني رأيت Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yakulu lahma al-dajaj. This is an interesting hadith. Very interesting hadith. On the authority of Zahdam al-Jarami, who reported, we were once in the company of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, companion of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, and some chicken was brought. One man distanced himself and said, no, 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 no. We said, what's wrong with you? The man replied, I saw that chicken eating something impure. So I swore I would never eat it. Then Abu Musa said, come. For I saw the messenger of Allah, alayhi wasalam, eat chicken. Many different interpretations of this hadith. One is that that man was actually engaging in uh, a prophetic practice that we do not eat animals that eat filth. If an animal is raised um, um, and it's not uh, fed quality feed, that we don't, we don't eat animals that are fed filth or that, that feed on filth. But then someone said that 
Abu Musa was also engaged in a prophetic practice that when food is presented to you as a gift, you don't uh, investigate it in that way, right? It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not appropriate to, if someone presents you with food as a gift or you're being hosted, it's not appropriate to ask, so is, you know, uh, what kind of feed was this chicken given? How was the chicken raised? Is it a free range chicken? Was it a chicken, you know, placed in a cage with his beak snapped off? Was it, it's not appropriate, that's not, that's not appropriate. And that what Abu Mus al Ali was really demonstrating was that when the Prophet والسلام, was presented with food, he would say Bismillah and he would eat. Right? He wasn't, as some people jokingly refer to such people as a food Nazi. Like, what is this? Wait, wait, hold on, wait, wait. Which is interesting. You know, there's a good book. Um, there's a good book called Righteous Mind by uh, Jonathan Haidt, right? And to make a long story short, he breaks down human kind of moral uh, pursuits, right? That human beings over across time space have had moral impulses that can be divided into like five or six categories. This is a very ambitious study, <laughs> right? But among the moral categories that he identifies, one of them is sanctity purity, sanctity purity, right? That this is something that shows up kind of in the human experience broadly as an area that human beings display moral concern with sanctity purity. And he said, the basic idea is that one can attain goodness through what one does or does not do with their body. That's the idea of sanctity purity. And he says that, for religious folks, the mind will immediately go to sexual propriety, virginity, right? He said, but even for non-religious people, they display that same impulse usually within food, right? I only eat organic. I only, no, no I, don't, I, don't, I don't eat this kind of food. I don't eat that kind of food. It becomes clear that the pursuit is not simply one of nutrition. I mean, if, if, because for many of them, even if I could show you the nutritional value of this banana is really no different than the nutritional value of this banana. They're, they have accepted that there is virtue in eating the organic banana. There's, it, is, it is more consistent with the state of being that I want to achieve as a human being. It's not just about nourishing my body, you know, um, and marketers that are masters at playing on our moral sensibilities, they know how to play to that. So the brand is called Purity. So you're looking at granola bars and you see one, Purity. Yeah, I want this one. <laughs> purity. It's like, oh, yeah, even though this one costs double, why are you buying it? Because it's called Purity. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think which book, but it's not Ingalls. I believe it's Marx. It might be in Das Kapital, but Marx mentions that the defining characteristic of capitalism is alienation, which is really brilliant. You know, I mean, I'm no Marxist, but there are some aspects of Marxist philosophy that are, that are very, very insightful and very brilliant. That everyone is alienated from everyone else. So when you are alienated from the people that produce 
your food. Your only concern is getting it for the lowest price possible. Because it's, it doesn't even arrive to me through like a real process. Whereas if I had an investment in the people that produce something, like my barber, for instance, that's, that's, this is one of the, the remaining, or your hairdresser, this is one remaining business that is still very, very, there is no alienation, right? You know this person. You often know their children. You know their name. You know where they live. They, although, you know, my bar, my, a former barber of mine, uh, Brother Nassim, <laughs> Nassim said, you know, even, and he, we weren't talking philosophy. He was just being, you know, just, just talking about his experience. He said, you know, some people really think I'm a robot that just cuts hair. And when they see me somewhere else, they express like surprise. Like if they see me at like the grocery store, they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> he like, the same thing you're doing. I'm, I'm buying some groceries. He said, because they really think that all I do, <laughs> all I do is sit. He said, you know, some mornings I like to go out for walks. Sometimes I go to the gym. Sometimes I take my children to the park. <laughs> Sometimes I go to the movies. <laughs> he said that people will see me in a different context, like, yo, what's, what's up, man? What you doing here? And I trying to order a cheeseburger. It's the same thing, same thing you're doing here. But that might be a part of that alienation that you really don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not connected to, to the process. And then, of course, extending Marxist theory, the vendors themselves, the farmers, the producers, the workers themselves, they're alienated from each other. So their only concern is, um, you, know, uh, you know, getting a wage. Whereas if they recognize that they were a collective, they would bargain collectively, right? They would bargain collectively, but they're alienated from each other. Nobody can really see each other. The way that we consume Farmers markets just couldn't sustain the rate at which we eat meat. Couldn't, like, like when we think about all of the, the pesticides and the chemicals, and I mean, let me consider this, man. And I, I mean, again, I, I, I am totally inexperienced and just a, 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 a neophyte novice reader when it comes to, um, um, What's the term I'm looking for? Um, anthropo not anthropology, but geology, uh, ecology, just, right? But when I was trying to, to learn about this, this, this phase that many ecologists say that we're entering called the Anthropocene age, where human beings, human beings have a disproportionate impact on kind of, you know, uh, the natural phenomena of the planet. One example that they gave was in the year 13, whatever, a chicken was just one species among different species of birds. But it wasn't like the most prominent species. It was just like, you have chickens and you have this and you have that due to people harvesting chicken because chicken is the most consumed meat. Because now there's like 100 times more chickens than existed at that time, right? Why am I mentioning this? Is that the way that we consume, it, 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 it's, 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 it's very hard to have a natural relationship with consumption. This is like, when you step out of the DIC, and you look down state and people now are talking about like the supply chain. Human beings have never enjoyed this kind of access to stuff. And many places in the world, they don't, right? In season, out of season, it makes no difference, right? So, you know, um, the short answer to your question, and I, I've yet to even implement this myself, but what I, I've heard one person say, and I don't even know if this is a solution. 
better, more expensive, less. Buy better, it's gonna be more expensive. If you want meat from an Amish person that you know that slaughters the meat, that you go pick it up, it's probably gonna cost a little bit more than going to Mariano's, right? But then the other part of that, eat less. Eat less meat. If you, if you buy it, because it's going to be more expensive, but it's going to be better. And you'll taste the difference. You'll feel the difference, right? I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, um, um, uh, I'm not like one of those like super intuitive spiritual people. I'm, I'm not, I'm not one of those people. But Alhamdulillah, I try to eat meat that is halal and tayyib, that is lawful and that was ethically and sustainably raised. I try, right, to the best of my ability. I'm not like super, yeah, I need, you know, like coming in with a whole checklist for the vendor, but, you know, I try to, I'm conscientious about it. I'm intentional about it, right? I can taste and feel the difference between eating that and eating just whatever is served in any restaurant. Now, if I'm a guest in somebody's home, I don't, I, whatever they serve me, I'm just, I'm just happy to be a guest. And inshallah, being a good guest, I pray will fill up the scales of barakah. And I'm not going to give anybody a hard time to serve me food in their home. But if I'm paying my money, yeah, I reserve the right to be a little bit um, um, scrupulous, a little bit cautious. So I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that buying better, which inevitably is going to be more expensive, and then eating a little bit less. You know what I'm saying? And you know, one thing that's actually a, little, a, a very cool project is personalize your shopping where you can. Like, like I have a personal relationship with my barber, of course, what if I had a personal relationship with the person that made my clothes? Or had a personal relationship with the person that repaired my car, right? You would, I mean, you could really, you would see that your, um, your experience of consumption would change. Or you had a personal relationship with the person that grew some of your food, right? Or the personal relationship with the person that sold you some of your meat, right? Even just going to a butcher shop and you know the person's name. Hey, Muhammad, salam alaikum. Muhammad, how are you, man? It, 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 feel, it feels a lot different. I, one, thing I, like one thing I note, when I have a personal relationship with the vendor, I don't, I'm not as concerned about the few cents I might be losing on the price. You know, the shopping is a part of the overall experience, right? When I have no relationship with the vendor, that's all I care about is the price. Wait, hold on, I can get it better here. I don't, wait, wait, hold on, wait, hold on, hold on. Oh, they got it down the street. I get three for 10. You got them two for 10. Do you price match? But if I know the person selling them two for 10, yeah, give me four. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I saw it. How old are your kid? Your son is, he's graduating. It's, it's all in the process of a, of a relationship. You see? Now, if you don't know the person, I don't know you. I mean, subhanAllah, we go to, we go to like stores. And the people wear name tags. I don't even think we look at them half the time. But I mean, even, even like American corporatism recognizes that there should be some personability here, right? I mean, the people wear name tags. How often do you actually, you know, sometimes like <laughs> I go to the store and I call the people by their names on the name tags. And they look around like, I'm like, thank you, Sandy. She's like, how you know my name? It's, it's on your shirt. I'd assume that it's on your shirt for me to use the name. <laughs> but we're so accustomed to what Marx described in that alienation. Like, you're not supposed to know my, I'm supposed to be like an automaton robot that just checks your food out. And, you know, I was, uh, I was getting onto a plane uh, yesterday and we were coming down the jet bridge and, um, um, uh, you know, they were, they were gate checking luggage. And the gentleman in front of me said to the, the man uh, checking the luggage, thank you for working, man. I appreciate it. How are you? And he was an older, like middle-aged white man. 
And the guy working on the jet bridge was a black man. He looked at him. He said, no problem, but I appreciate that. And when I got on the plane, I said, you know, man, that was a, that was a, that was a nice gesture, man. Sometimes we don't even say thank you to people that are working, providing critical services for us, man. Getting our luggage and loading them on the planes and loading them off of planes. A lot of people, we just walk right past that person. He said, hey, thank you for working, man. Thank you for working, I appreciate it. And when I saw the effect that it had on that young black man, no problem. I appreciate that. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start doing that more, man. I told him, I said, you know, I, I appreciated that, man. I'm, I'm gonna start doing that a little bit more, you know, but that's part of what we, we live with is this kind of work. It's something we don't really respect work. You know, uh, a lot of people think it's related to the history of enslavement in this country. Work is something, you know, we look at people working almost like if people work with their hands, Right? So when you form a relationship with people that have to do the work necessary to bring you your food, your vegetables, your fruits, your meats, your grain, et cetera, um, you'll feel differently about them. You'll feel differently about work. You'll probably consume it differently. Right? SubhanAllah. And we'll stop there, inshallah. Um, if anybody had any questions, ideas, concerns, Oh yeah, anything, um, anything. So you know, the this this was something from the the what we call the Zaybiyat, like the the knowledge of the kind of unseen that the Prophet Ali would tell people: don't sleep on your stomachs. It's one of those things that is just ta'abudi. We don't know exactly why, but he would say, don't, don't sleep on the stomach. It's not, it's not good. Now, Muslims being Muslims, they've searched for all kinds of, it, 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 it leads to indigestion, <laughs> you know, which you know, I always encounter those, those kinds of suggestions uh, with good natured, mashallah. I don't know if it's true or not, but the fact that Someone believes that if the prophet has given us something, there has to be some tangible, demonstrable good in it. I think that that's indicative of a deep faith. For me, I'm like, I don't know if any of that's true, but the prophet of said, don't do it. I try, I try not to do it. But if a person is asleep and they roll over on their stomach, no need to wake them up. I, I will hope it's not that serious. <laughs> you know, no need to, you know, a person is like getting in their REM sleep. Don't sleep on your stomach. Call the Nabi Ali so It's like, I'm about to strangle you, man. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, we're not makallaf for what we do when we're asleep. You know, we're not morally responsible if I roll over on my stomach. But the Prophet Ali uh, did say, don't sleep on your stomach. Some people have an amazing ability. They sleep like on like the thinnest edge of their side. You know, it just looks like they're on their stomach. But I'm like, you might as well just go ahead and sleep on your stomach. You know, but they, somehow it's like, no, no, this is my side. <laughs> and I think that, that that's also expressive of a, you know, man, piety is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, really, you know, that. When you think of, just the fact that we're trying, I mean, guys, it's, it's been more than 1400 years, man. Life has changed a great deal. Society has changed a great deal. And just the fact that out of love for God, we're trying to make sense of this, trying to apply it to our lives in ways that are authentic, but also that make sense. You know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a powerful thing, man. It's a powerful thing, you know. Um, and I'm always sensitive to where someone lands in terms of trying to make sense. Like, you know, I'm, I'm never critical of a person trying to make sense of Islam. Like I'm trying to, you know, you know I, I'm, because that entire process to me is indicative of their Iman. Like I believe this, 
That's why I'm trying to make some sense out of this, right? I'm also a person that, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm alive, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm here, I'm present. So I can't deny that either, but I do see enduring value in this. And I'm trying to, you know, so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm always uh, astounded by, you know, uh, just that the, the tension produced in that struggle. And I think that's what E-Man is all about. It's like, the, the, you know, it's like, man, okay, I'm trying to, you know, I really like sleeping on my stomach. But the Prophet said, don't sleep on your stomach. Okay, I'm gonna sleep on this little part of my side. It's kind of like, my <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, man, and there's somebody <clears throat> that I'm thinking about in particular that sleeps like that. I feel the whole lot. Man, love preserving. I was like, babe, you sleeping on your stomach. That's not my stomach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, even, even, even things like, you know, the Prophet والسلام, would always clean out the, he would always wipe the bed spray before he, before he laid down in it. So, you know, now, some people say it's just a practice. In the desert, there's dust and there's, there's dust mites and all kinds of stuff. And it's practical. But I know people, they could be in the nicest room. They still do that in the summer. They get, come to the vet. I said, You think I paid all this money for a room at the Red Carlton? Did you do that? They better come in here and do that. <laughs> he said, Wait, this is Sunnah. This is the Sunnah of the Prophet. I didn't say, What's that? MashaAllah. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Any, anything else? Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr. Inna l-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa aminu al-salihati wa tawasib al-haq wa tawasib al-sabr. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. You guys put some dua up there, man. Allah can extend this good weather, man. Ameen, ya Rabbil. This is, you know, but now, man, with all the talk about climate change, you don't know whether to regard the weather as a blessing or an ominous sign, something to come. <laughs> I said, man, when it's just like, it's, it's nice and warm today. Is that good? Does that mean we're heading to a, you know, ecological collapse? Uh, you know, should I be thankful or should I be scared? You know what I'm saying?